Ladies and gentlemen, welcome into the Homegrown Happy Hour podcast. My special guest for this evening, doing it Zoom style, Miss Pentacket. How you doing? Hey, I'm good. I'm good. How you been doing? It's been a while since I, I talked. It's, it's been a while. I'm doing really good right now. Um, my job is, you know, things are kind of opening, opening up. And so, you know, I work with Kentucky 4-H with Communication and Expressive Arts Program. So I got to see my kids that I've been meeting via Zoom all year in person last week. Um, and they got to perform in front of a live audience. And um, so it was awesome. And then I got to, I've been out doing some performing too. And it's just been, it feels like just a, like a big sigh of relief has just come over me collectively. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that a lot of us feel that way. It feels so good to hug because I've always like we were talking before. Like I'm a hugger. I hug everybody, whether they want it or not. Like I, I'm, I'm hugging you. And well, I've, I I figured out that I I warn them now. Like if I kind of sense that they're introvert, I'm like I'm gonna hug you. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least at least you give them a warning. I, I've I've been like like pushed away before, like, mm, no. and I'm like yeah, okay. I do have a coworker that he is like what I mean he is no he I, he pushes me away quite you do a like bit. Matrix style and just I like, know he it. is completely trying to avoid me at all costs. But I'll like somehow tap him on the back or just do something and like run. Yeah, I, I was telling you the first person I hugged, and like it was super awkward for Shaw. I, I hugged Shaw around. That was the first person I hugged, and I, I got nervous after I done it. I'm like, oh my god, I, I might have just killed Shaw. I, I was, I, I was so scared. Did you hug her so tight she couldn't breathe? No, I'm just like with everything going on. Like, I don't know. Like it was so that the first hug, besides like anybody in my family, it was like weird going about it. But now it's but with you know, the vaccines and everything being I know. good now. We can hug without any worries and it feels yeah. so good. Oh man, I cannot wait to hug Shaw Reynolds. That's She's like on my list of people I must hug as soon as possible. I've seen where you're going to be uh, doing Wolfstock with I you. am, yeah. Oh, I love that event so much. Yeah, for uh, the people that don't know, like Wolfstock, it, it's an incredible event. They can find out a lot more about it online. But me and my wife were talking about this yesterday. This is going to be the fourth Wolfstock that they've done. That is mind blowing. I didn't know that it was that much. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess I've done it three. I don't know if I've done it three or maybe I've been on all four years. I don't know. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy that uh, it's been around that long. I know it's a great, it's a great event. Shaw is just an angel to all humans mm -hmm. and animals. Like she just, she's, a spectacular angel on this earth. <laughs> I love how she's unfiltered about it too. Like <laughs> with, with, with her Facebook posts, now she gives people warnings too. She'll say like right, right. language or whatever. But uh, I love how Shaw just is so unfiltered and real about her yeah. love for animals and yeah. real about her feelings about the people that treat animals unkindly. Right. And well, yeah. I mean, her thing is, you know, they, they don't have a voice, so they need right. people to be a voice for them. And Shaw is, is that person fighting the good fight. I mean, that, that's a heck of a voice right there. And everybody with East Kentucky Animal Alliance, I mean, they are incredible people. And Wolfstock, I mean, I, I forgot who all is on the bill. I'd have to look at it again. I know, I know me and Beck, I, I can't even remember. Well, that, and that's another thing too, like, uh, there forever, there was not, a lot of uh, stuff going on and just not a lot of events to promote or anything like that. And now it's all of a sudden it's like, like that. Yeah. There's so many that it's, it's hard to keep up with everything. Yeah. Here it is for the people that want to check it out. August 20th, 2021 back in the starlight review, Sean Whiting, Cole town, Dixie, Chelsea Nolan, Jen Tackett. All right. And Eddie Jenkins. Nice. It's going to be a good show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always so much, so much fun um, because, you know, all those people are like family um, anyway. So, and usually backstage is a pretty interesting place too. Well, it's, it's cool because like a lot of these, uh, the bills that I'm seeing for these events, like this one right here, like it's uh, all my friends and every, like, and their friends' friends. And like, it's like a, uh, it's a, it's a community more than just a gathering of artists. It's, Absolutely, it's friends yeah. hanging out, having a good time. It seems like. Yeah, it really, it really is, and that's what you know. I have a full time job. Music is my is my passion, 
Um, and I, I do this for fun. I do this for fun. This is like, you know, I could be staying home knitting all the time, but I'm writing songs and performing. And then when you can do what you love with amazing people, it just makes it like a million times better. Yeah. I want to ask you about your 4-H stuff because I see a lot of the stuff that you post on your uh, yeah. personal page there. And it seems so cool. The things that you do with the kids, what, what is it called again? Like the fancy name for it? Uh, the Our Kentucky family? 4-H Performing Arts Troupe. Oh, okay. Okay. I like that. For so, my job. Which, like the one that you said before. The, like, the Performing Arts Troupe, Kentucky 4-H Performing Arts Troupe. I thought you said something else at the beginning of this. Never mind. Um, <laughs> oh, Communication Expressive Arts? That is it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm like, I thought she said we'll get there. Else. I'm like, yeah. So that's, I'm in charge. Um, I was a, I've been in extension in 4-H for 17 years. Um, and I started out as a county 4-H agent, and I've now been on campus at UK for nine years uh, working with communication expressive arts programs. So um, I work with like state level opportunities, including the Kentucky 4-H Performing Arts Troupe. Um, and then I've started this year during COVID, the Kentucky 4-H uh, statewide virtual virtual ukulele club which was awesome um and then i do like uh di just different programs across the state and train agents and um do different things to hopefully inspire and help kids find their spark in the arts it, it really is cool so like what are some of the things that you do with the kids um so with the performing arts troupe you know they are high school kids from all across kentucky they audition um, and we look at, we kind of do like a leadership component. You know, we want them to be good team members. Um, we do a mentoring pro, uh, thing where they mentor younger 4-Hers. Uh, we do a career component where they learn about careers in, in the performing arts. You know, I want them to not just think that the person standing on the stage is all that there is to uh, the music business field. And um, and then obviously performance. So, you know, we help them build confidence and stage presence and help help them, you know, some of them have amazing voices, um, but they don't always necessarily see what we see. And so I kind of help them see what I see in them um, and help them become better performers. Was this a program that was like always around or is this relatively mm -hmm. a new thing? Because I was in 4-H as a kid and I don't remember this. No. So when I came on uh, as a state specialist, it was my, it was kind of my dream um, to start this. There are a couple other states that have stuff similar. Um, Georgia and Tennessee have uh, performing arts troops as well. And so, you know, I went and visited with them to kind of see how they started it and, um, my first year I had four girls and we used all backing tracks and, you know, now we have like 15 kids and, you know, sometimes, some years it, it depends on what, who we get, but you know, some years we've had full bands Wow. with 15 wow. kids. Yeah. I, I remember you uh, saying earlier about how they uh, got to perform in front of a live audience this year. Yeah. Was, yes. Uh, out of all the kids, was that probably like the, the ones that had the most nerve wracking experience? Cause I would like, like with everything that happened last year, you know, to, uh, I mean, like whenever I, the first time I got on stage as a kid, I was already nerve wracked enough, but yeah. you know, just getting into the minds of some of those kids, not being around people for almost a year, not being around society for almost a year. And then you're in front of, everybody what was that like well so we came in on tuesday and we you know met with the sound people and we did sound checks and, and run throughs and you know that's where i'm just like i can see them getting in their head and i'm like look you need to have fun like this is fun i was like more than likely most of the people in the audience if you mess up a lyric or something like that you know they're not going to pick up on it they're just going to be like wow this person is so talented i was like so just don't let your face show it and go and and go on um and so you know we gave gave them practice and of course you know I, i'm giving them pep talk there's one girl that this is her first time ever being in 4-h um and ever you know she's i think she's sung a lot in some in church and stuff but she was so nervous but like i could see her before her performance like a crossway because i made sure because everybody was masked, you know, in the audience, but I set my chair right up front and I took my mask off because I was like, as a performer, you feed off 
the facial expressions and the feedback from the audience. So I was like, I have to sit in front of these kids with a smile so that they can at least see one person. Um, but I looked across the way and I could just tell, I mean, her little feet were just moving. And um, so I sent her a text. I was like, you are beautiful and so talented and you are going to rock this. And she did. She got up there and, you know, she rocked it. And she texted me later and she was like, my mom said that it's the best performance I ever had. And I was like, girl, you're just going to get better. You know, she's, I think she's just a freshman. So hopefully I'll have her for like three more years. And I can't wait to see, because I've seen some like serious growth um, in kids that I've started with over the, you know, four years. And, and uh, it's just, it's, it's, I'm super blessed. <laughs> Do a lot of kids like stick with it after they're out of the program? I have some. So, you know, I've had kids, we, like I said, we do a career component. Um, usually we take like a careers trip and I try to like take them to a Broadway show and we usually record a song. We go to radio stations. Um, we've vis visited with booking agents and venue owners. Um, so I try to show them like a broad, you know, scope of what they can do. Um, and I usually go around the state and do, you know, so they can see the state as well. But, um, we had some people come and talk about music therapy. So I had, um, two, two, I had two kids that, that they figured out that's what they wanted to go to school for. So they're going to school for music therapy. Um, I had some kids that went into music education because of meeting with it. And then I have, you know, I have a couple kids that are, you know, um, playing out and, you know, and gigging some here and there. So that makes me happy too. That's awesome. What is music therapy? So music therapy, it's basically like, I mean, you go through like the college of, of health, you know, like it's like, um, but it's basically like working with patients, using music to work with patients um, to help them. You know, there's lots of things that show like with people with dementia and, you know, that how music can change the brain and stuff. So it's stuff along that line. I've seen some of those videos that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I've seen like this old woman in her 90s or something like that. Unfortunately, she had Alzheimer's and dementia. And they uh, played her a song from the 1950s, and she hummed every single word. Right, right. It, it just goes to show the power of music. It's it's an amazing thing. It's it's really, I mean, like, I, I wish I could understand it a little bit more because, you know, whether you're 99 years old or if even if, like, a, a newborn baby, that doesn't even know right. the word music. Like I've right. had um, kids around and I've uh, had my niece and nephews whenever they were really little, I'd play them music, them not even a year old, and they would dance or move around or yeah. smile. And right. just, the music has an impact on somebody that doesn't even know what music is. Right. It's a right. very powerful, weird, complex thing. It's, it's awesome. You know, I, I have gone into schools and taught like rhythm and use rhythm sticks and stuff. And, you know, I always tell them, I was like, we all have, like our heart is a rhythm. Our breathing is a rhythm. Like we have music in us. Um, so, you know, usually when people say I don't have rhythm, I'm like, yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, well, everybody likes it. That's another thing too that I've uh, thought about with music is I mean, there's, Stuff, stuff that people agree with everywhere. Some people like baseball, some people don't. Some people like boxing, some people don't. Some people like cars, some right. people don't. But everybody likes music. I've not yeah. met one person that doesn't like some type of music somewhere. Right, right. You know, I um, I always, <clears throat> I had to, we had to, wanted to like set our, um, noise ordinance later in Georgetown um, because there were some music venues that wanted to do some later things. And so I went and talked to like pre presented at our town council meeting about it. And, you know, I always say that we use music to add value to everything. If you want your wedding to be better, you add music. If you want the movie to you're watching to be better, you add music. You know, if you, it, every time we use music to add value to everything. And I think it's important <laughs> that we value music, you know, like, and the, the program arts and arts in general. So, because we use music and art to add value to everything. And so I think this is why events like, you know, the Mountain Girl Experience um, is, are important because it's people that value art and see uh, the value in it and see how it's impact on, um, you know, young girls and women uh, in the, across the state, across the nation, everywhere. Yeah. 
I was, yeah, I was getting really scared a few years ago whenever they were talking about taking out a lot of the art programs in school and just in education across the board. Because there's so many kids that may not be a football player, that may not be, you know, uh, very good in their uh, studies, may not want to be a mathematician or something like that. You know, uh, music has saved people's lives. And it, it really has. And, you know, um, that's one of the things with 4-H that I've made it kind of my priority is because like, you know, um, if school, if, if a kid doesn't have arts or music in school and they can't afford to take lessons, there's a whole gap of kids that we're missing. And so that's why, you know, and of course in Extension, we try to, um, you know, offer everything without a fee or we can find scholarships. But that's why I think it's so important because, you know, and I've talked to people talked about during the shutdown, like what percentage of like young artists did have we lost because they didn't have an open mic to go to, to try out new songs, you know, cause there's kind of like a ladder that you take to become an artist. And, you know, so for a whole year and a half, there were artists out there that didn't have opportunities to share their songs at open mics or, or perform or, you know, better their craft. And um, I'm hoping that, you know, we're we're past that and hopefully those people still come around but somebody talked about that and i was like you know i didn't think about that because we may have lost you know lots of artists because of that well i mean it, it's all about expressing yourselves a lot with a lot mm -hmm. a lot with art because you know us entertainers we're weird we're very weird yeah. a lot of times <laughs> a, lot, a lot of times we may not find will not have somebody to talk to or uh, the only way that we can really express the way that we're feeling is through a song or through whatever piece of entertainment that you may be doing. And yeah, I can totally get that. If you're not able to express yourself and get those feelings out, they're all just going to bottle up and who knows what can happen with that. Right. It's I've always thought it was a weird yet beautiful thing that somebody's like, I'm sad. I'm going to write a song about it. No, it's just like there, there's so many people that like if you're just sad, you're sad. But I think right. that if you can turn uh, those bad feelings into something beautiful and also somebody out there may can relate to it, it's right. it's just such a powerful thing. Music. Yeah, I, I heard, um, I saw a, a TED Talk um, one time and they said songwriting and, and, most, and, and most forms of art turn you from the story to the storyteller and that gives you power over it you know so there's I think and that's why you know I teach songwriting and I'm going to teach ballad writing um at Mountain Girl the Mountain yeah. Girl experience um because there's power in in telling your story and getting those and, and that's how a lot of artists process things um so I think that's that's just a, a good way to process feelings. And like I said, I teach songwriting all the time. I saw, taught it last week um, with, with my performing arts troupe. Um, Cause I think it's, it's just, especially, I know they're artists and I know they have that artist brain. So I'm trying to give them this way to put those feelings and emotion into song. And hopefully, you know, I've got quite a few that are interested in songwriting and a little girl, um, texted me, you know, that she finished her song that she started with me and she's, now she wants to write more and record an EP. And so we're trying to help her out and get that done. That's so cool. It, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see the younger generation, younger generation be so involved in important music. Oh, and, yeah. and, and I think that it's, you know, going back to uh, people relating to it, there's been a lot of times where I've felt certain things in life that I don't think that anybody else is feeling. And I don't feel like I can talk to anybody else because they may not understand. But right. then you find a song from somebody who is saying the exact same thing that's on your mind. And it's, it's so awesome that music can help people not feel so alone. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, you know, I've written songs about dark periods of my life. And, you know, sometimes I, I feel like I feel like an artist. That's kind of our job is to put those out there because of things like that, because there are people that have went through it and you do want to make sure that um, people can connect and, and not, not feel alone because more than likely there's definitely somebody out there. I tell, when I teach songwriting, I, you know, I told my kids last week, um, I said, I, I usually say when you have a song in your head, 
or in your heart, it's important to get it out because there's always one person that needs to hear it and it may just be you. Um, but there's always like one that. person. I like that. That's good. That's yeah. really good. That should be on like one of them like pretty Facebook. <laughs> yeah. I should make that. I can break out Canva. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, I think that it's such an important thing though. And that's why I'm, I don't know whatever happened with that funding issue that they were having, but I am seeing that a lot of art pro programs uh, popping up here and there yeah. in certain places. And I think that it's a beautiful thing for uh, kids to grow up on the uh, good music. And that's another thing that I'm seeing too, with even with pop music, there, ha there seems to be like some substance coming back into it. Like, especially with the country movement, how the biggest people in there right now are probably Tyler Childers, Chris Stapleton, and Sturgill Simpson. Right. They're not the ones singing about, oh, uh, country girls shake it for me on the back of a tailgate with a right. Budweiser or whatever. I know they're actually singing about actual real life events, especially Jason Isbell too. Oh, Billy Strings. I mean, I can go yeah. on yeah. and on. But when the song has some actual substance to it, I think that it is a beautiful thing for the world. And that's unfortunately what I think a lot of kids are, uh, that are growing up nowadays with some of this music may not be, well, may not be realizing and right. may be missing them. Like whenever I was growing up on music, like I kind of grew up on the classic rock era and uh, classic country, outlaw country, stuff like that. But then guys and gals in there, they, they told stories. Right. And it wasn't about money. It wasn't about the fancy things that you had. It was about, getting your artistic expression out there. And right. I, I, I just love that you can see some popular artists nowadays coming back with actual substance in their music. Yeah, I think that um, people are kind of hungry for real and genuine artists right now. Um, and you're right, that's what country music was founded on, you know, simplicity and telling a story and sharing your truth. Um, so I think, I think that I'm glad that I have young people and I've probably, you know, before when we could travel and stuff, I would probably force them to listen to, <laughs> to things that they may have not wanted to listen to. But, you know, I turned some kids on to uh, Jason Isbell and John Moreland and, uh, you know, John Prine and, um, you know, Linda Ron, Linda Ronstad and, um, St. Paul and the Broken Bones. You know, I've played them St. Paul and the Broken Bones when I was like, this is passion. You're the only person that I know that knows who that band is. Maybe I have other <laughs> friends, but you're the only person that actually like, came out and said it. I love St. Paul and the Broken Bones. I do Call too. Me. That's one of my favorite songs of all time. Yeah. It's such a good tune. It's great. But I, you know, I, I try to like show them artists that I think, you know, are because I, I, you know, I tell them, I was like, it doesn't matter how talented you are. If you're not feeling it, if you're not connecting to the lyric and connecting to the audience, you know, you have to feel it and then the audience will feel it. And so I show them St. Paul and the Broken Bones, a performance of them. And I'm like, that's passion. That's connecting to a lyric. He did not write that song. It, I'm trying to think of what. Um, was it what the Tiny Desk concert? No, it was just, it was like them. They were literally just like outside somewhere. And I'm, I can't even, I'll have to, I have to look, I can't even remember what song, but it was a cover. But I said, you know, you would think that he wrote that song the way he's singing it. And I was like, and that's what you all need to do as performers. You need to connect with it. Um, and that, you know, we, I talked to him about song selection and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, I try to introduce them to artists, um, maybe outside the mainstream so that, you know, they can see passionate performers and good songwriters. Um, so, like I said, on road trips, you know, they probably listen to maybe like a little bit more than they bargained for with me, but I'm always educating. <laughs> and it, it, it's important though, because I mean, somebody has to do it. And I think right. that you know, if the kids go by what society tells them to listen to nowadays, they're going to be steered severely in the wrong direction. I'm so thankful that I grew up with great parents and an yeah. awesome brother and uh, different people in my life that actually showed me what actual good music was right, and the right. importance of it. Oh yeah. I mean, we, um, my dad, you know, he, his farm truck was always playing like our local rock and roll station. And then my, my granny was into blues and mom was kind of like, 
in between like pop country, you know, country kind of things in the eighties. So, you know, we kind of, I was, I was experienced at all, you know, all types of music. And uh, I love, I still love all types of music. Well, it's like one type of music that you like that people generally wouldn't think that you would like. 90s rap. For real? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. That, that's kind of left field for me. I wasn't expecting that. I was maybe expecting jazz or something. What 90s rap do you like? Oh gosh. I mean like, um, Jay-Z, um, it's probably, he's one of my favorite artists. Um, his MTV Unplugged album is just one of my favorites of all yeah, time. People don't know about that. That's one of my favorite albums of all time. Yeah, Jay-Z was the man. I, I loved all 90s rap. See, like, uh, whenever I was younger, I wasn't really big on the hip-hop that was popular then. It was all 90s rap, like, yeah. you had Tupac Biggie, Naughty by Nature, yeah. old Jay-Z stuff. Remember the thing that he done with Linkin Park back in the day? Yeah, what was album they done? I'm trying to think of what the song was. They, uh, they done like a whole album together, and not a lot of people remember it. Not a lot of people remember the unplugged uh, Jay Z either. It's so good. It's so good. And I also usually when I do my mic check, I do uh, Rump Shaker by Rex and Effect. Ah, it's a good tune. It's a good tune. So that's that's, that's back when rap was good. <laughs> but and, and Jay Z, I mean that guy. Like I know he's the hip hop billionaire that he is but did you know he didn't like, he doesn't write anything oh really yeah it's all memory he like so people, crazy, people that are in the studio with him they say he never touches a pen it is all memorized yeah i just i think he's all i think he's awesome he's one oh, of my yeah. favorites there's a well, 99 problems is my probably my favorite song by him it's just a good tune gets me pumped it really, up it really well, I, is. Uh, yeah, like if I ever like want to just like take on the world, I'll turn on some Jay Z. He just makes me feel rich and powerful every time I listen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to try that. I'm gonna get in my Toyota. And <laughs> yeah, I, like, well, I, I, I feel rich and powerful today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, before like before any gig or something like that, um, Jay Z is my go-to because like I don't know, it's just like he makes you feel powerful. It ain't about like. Oh, I got enough stuff, or I can rap good. Like, no, he's he's just talking about being a boss, and it makes you feel like a yeah. boss. Like, okay, yeah, I'm rich. It's funny. Too. It's funny how like we have different like musicians for different uh, moments, or like yeah. we have that fulfill different needs. Like, if I'm sad, I'm playing Don Williams all day long. Like, I tell my I, friends, I, I get too sad. <laughs> but, well, I don't know. It's like how I process, but I'm like. If you see me like eating a blizzard and listening to Don Williams, call, like, come get me. <laughs> that is a sure sign that I'm not doing so great. <laughs> yeah, my go to sad stuff is probably just, ah, what would it even be? Well, it's really just any outlaw country. I'll go through Johnny Paycheck and the old George Jones and yeah. Waylon and all of them guys. Yes, the. Uh, my sad drinking stuff, basically. But yeah, yeah. It, it is funny how we have uh, something for everything. And just, again, shows the power of music that no matter what the occasion is, there's yeah. the perfect music for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, especially how you're talking about weddings uh, earlier. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like, I uh, did a lot of wedding singing before I um, started playing my own stuff out. Really? A lot of wedding singing, yeah. How did those go? I, see, I, I DJ weddings, so I know sometimes how crazy they can get. Well, you know, I've I've only had one story, and this was back in it was this like two thousand and one, um, and it was for a girl that I went to college with. She's still a good friend of mine, but the people running the sound the night of the the rehearsal didn't show up, and they're like, "We'll just come tomorrow." And we'll be, it'll be fine. I was like, okay, you know, so it back then all my background music was on cassette tapes. <laughs> so I had this cassette tape um, and I'm, I'm trying to think of what song I was supposed to do. It was the, um, it was the song from, Anyway, it was a country love song. It wasn't like Cross My Heart or something like that. Um, 
but I had, I was doing like five songs in this wedding thing. And so I told them, I was like, they're on this side of the cassette or whatever. So somehow they switched it. And when I was supposed to be singing this, um, oh, it was feels like home to me. Oh. Um, and when I was supposed to sing that, Johnny B. Good started playing. And it was like, na 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 And I was like, oh, my God. So I, like, reach over the sound people, and I, like, smack it uh, to stop. And I'm like, you've got it on the wrong side. So I had to switch it and rewind it, and it was fine. But I was like, oh, my God. You should have just broke into Johnny B. Good, to be honest. That would have been <laughs> – was it like a first dance or anything? That was right up in the church. It was right up in the church. First thing, like they had been playing like the me. It was like while people were sitting, you know, or whatever. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I've had some outdoor stuff where I've, sound equipment just didn't work. So I just had to wing it, just go, sing. Go acapella, basically. Yeah, just go acapella. Yeah. Um, yeah, but. Some crazy yeah, stuff wedding. happens at weddings. People do not know. I know it's, it's, it's crazy. It is crazy. And I, um, but I, I enjoy it. Like, you know, I love love and love seeing people in love. So um, I always enjoy it, but I'm always like, Oh my gosh, I think about that Johnny be good moment, but thank goodness we don't have to use cassette tapes anymore. <laughs> it, it's cool whenever you're at an event like that though. And like after you get done playing or even like during the middle of it, you kind of see like if, in the middle of you singing, if you see like an older couple get up and start dancing together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like you ignited that flame to get that back going. Like it's just the, to know the impact that you have on people, like that is a high, like no other. You can't explain I, that to somebody who isn't in this field. It's such I know. A I'm, I'm like, bring the tears. That's what I want to do. I want to bring the tears. <laughs> but oh, I will say, I forgot the last wedding. I think I, played at was a friend they got married in the gorge and it like it was supposed to be like warm and it ended up snowing um and it was freezing we were on the top of this mountain and so i wore this like it's like a fake fur, fur coat but i'm like my hands are freezing i'm trying to play the guitar i look like like this country bear on the side of a mountain trying to play like a country pimp. huh you could have been a country pimp as well <laughs> It is kind of a pimp jacket. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. It is kind of, but my fingers were frozen, but we got through it and it was a beautiful, it was beautiful. Even though we were all frozen. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful thing. What made you want to get into music? Well, I've always, you know, um, I've always loved me, loved music. It's always been a part of my life. Like literally the first thing I can remember is my dad playing, you know, Blondie records. Um, mom said, you know, my first gig was we, my dad was a farmer and we lived on this big farm and some of the other, you know, farm people lived on the houses and one of, he would pay me a quarter to sing, Hey, good looking. When I was like three on the kitchen table, you know, my dad's friends would get me to sing that and family reunions, you know, sitting on tobacco wagons, me and my cousin doing Judd's harmony. Yeah. Um, so it's just always, it's always been a part of my life and um, was in choir all throughout high school and, um, I have always written songs, started writing, my, writing when, songs and poetry when I was like in third grade. So I've always wow. written. Um, and, you know, it was hard for me when I uh, was getting ready to graduate when I'm my senior year. You know, I started out, I was going to go to Nashville um, and, and study music business, and music ed, and ended up my senior year. I uh, Took and got into a horticulture class. I always grew up on a farm. Love agriculture, and music are my two passions that I have in life. And but I was like, I don't want to take farm classes. Like you know, I don't want to be poor. <laughs> I've seen my family struggle in agriculture and farming. I don't want to do that. Um, but I got put just like a schedule issue into a horticulture class. And um, you know, you're talking about earlier. I saw kids um, in horticulture and and ag classes excel that were failing in other classes and i was like that's what i want to do i want to help those kids and so i ended up going to uk and studying agriculture education so that's how um i got in got into um 4-h so but it kind of came full, full circle with my current position i'm kind of now back to doing music and art 
it, it's so, so awesome though that it seems to me that a lot of kids that are in education nowadays and just public school in general have so many different types of courses that they can take in school that yeah. will help them later on in life like whenever i was in school the other two programs were well the three programs you had band you had rotc and you had mm -hmm. nursing and, and i loved band and stuff like that but i didn't want to become a band teacher i still enjoyed music and i yeah. was in that but i definitely didn't want to go into the army no offense to anybody there i just that wasn't my route and right. i wasn't a nurse type either so i just felt like there was no there was nothing for that and nowadays i'm seeing like how you're talking about there's uh with the 4-H program that you do. I'm seeing carpentry programs popping up a lot, uh, mechanic programs in high school. Because yeah, like you said, uh, I was talking with this uh, one guy, he teaches a construction class where I graduated at in Phelps. And he says that a lot of times he will get uh, what some people call the bad kids mm -hmm. in his class, the ones that aren't doing very well in their other social studies. And like you said, those are the kids that excel. And at the end of the program, they're not those bad kids anymore. Nice. It's, it's such a beautiful thing. I think that if the kids have more opportunity and options in school, then you'll see a lot less of the problems that you see in public education. I think so. You know, so my, I, I ended up getting my master's in vocational education too, because I do believe in that. And I think kids need options to figure out what their spark is, whether it's music, whether it's welding, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I, I used to could weld really, really good, by the way. That's good another time. interesting fact about me. Um, cool. But, you know, welding and, and different things like that. Uh, I, my advisor in college told us this story and he was a first year teacher in Western Kentucky. And he said he had one of the boys in his class that, you know, he didn't um, he didn't do well in any other class except agriculture. And um, he was telling us this because he said, as an educator, you don't give out, give kids black ribbons. Don't go to the teacher's lounge and talk about kids because that just associates that kid with that behavior and other teachers will come, become to expect it. And um, he was telling us that he had this boy and he went to the teacher's lounge and there was this teacher um, just bad mouthing this kid, just said he was dumb, he couldn't do anything, you know, and um, said, that little boy was in uh, in his class one afternoon. He looked out, and that teacher was trying to had cars had parked a little awry in the parking lot, and she couldn't get her um, her car out. So the thing that the teacher said about the boy was that is the dumbest kid I've ever met in my life. And so uh, Dr. Byers was watching this woman outside struggle and so with the boy and he said, well, why don't you go out there and, and help her? And uh, so the little boy walks outside and right gets the car right out. And Dr. <laughs> Byers says he come, Dr. Byers says the kid walks in and said, that is the dumbest woman I've ever met. <laughs> so that's like perfect analogy for vocational education and how we all learn different um, and we all have, you know, <laughs> Oh, that is so cool. That is such a good story. I mean, it, I mean, it is, it is so important. I, I'm for, like, I know a lot of my friends that if they had that route, I hope maybe they wouldn't be in some of the shape that they're in. And I think that hopefully, yeah. uh, especially with today's youth, I'm seeing like a radical change going on with the mentality of the youth today, but it's, it's a positive change. It seems like the younger generation is coming up in a much more caring time. Like people are kind of thinking twice about the things they say nowadays. It's uh, it's getting to be a little bit more of a kinder world. I think that uh, there's always going to be the bad, unfortunately, but I do think that uh, it has progressed in a much more kinder way. And hopefully the kids that are going to be uh, taken over in the future might can learn from conversations like this and uh, people like you as well. I hope so. You know, um, 4-H is head, heart, hands, and health. You know, we're about, you know, the pledge is head to clear thinking, heart to greater loyalty, hands to larger service, and health to better living for my club, my community, my country, and my world. And so that's what it's, you know, that's what we're all about. And um, we're, 
we work with awesome kids. So it's not just, we're not just trying to teach, I'm not just trying to teach kids how to perform. You know, I'm, I'm teaching them how to give back to their community, um, to use their voice. And I'm teaching them how to uh, be confident. So whatever job, you know, they um, take in later in life, it'll, it'll help them you know, be able to talk to people and, and communicate better. So, you know, it's like we want to want them to be good, good citizens and good leaders. How we get there is through, you know, their different things that they love, whether it's um, tractor driving or or performing arts. It, it's I think that it's so important for kids nowadays to realize that you don't have to be a doctor. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to be a mathematician. There's plenty of other trades out there to do. Oh, yeah. And it's very important that still pays very good. And you can still make a happy, good living at it. Right. I think that like it's, if a kid wants to go to college, that is great. But I do think that the public education system needs to focus that college isn't the only route. Yeah, we need to make sure we want kids to succeed and not all kids succeed in college, you know, and, and so, a lot of them may not have the money to pay for it or may not have the grades to right. get them scholarships. So yeah, there's plenty of other jobs out there that are still just as good and are very much needed. Yeah. Workforce um, and career development is becoming something that we're really um, concentrating on in on 4-H right now. So it's an, it's an important part of what we do. Well, I wanted to ask you about this because I don't remember this being a thing last time we talked, and I've been waiting to ask you this. Oh, Where did the little red boots come from? <laughs> okay, so um, me, Chelsea Nolan was doing a radio show in Nashville, and me and Chelsea and Alexis Faye just went down for the day. Um I have a cousin that is a musician in Nashville and he had somebody had to pull from his band. So he had like a last minute thing and he texted me and I was like, we'll be there. Chelsea will be there. Um, so we drove down there and we got down there early and there was some, there was some shops and I, I don't know. I was like, I would love to have some red boots. And um, I'm sorry. My dog is losing her mind downstairs. It's fine. Mine does the same thing. <laughs> um, and she's got little dog syndrome, but um, God love her. But anyway, we went to this boot place and they were like, the bargain stuff's in the basement. And I was like, well, I'm going straight to the basement. So I walk in the basement and I see them like first thing, like sitting there. And I, I'm like, oh my gosh, they're so beautiful. Um, and they were only like $60. It's not bad. And I was like, and they fit. I mean, it was like Cinderella. It was like country Cinderella. And like, cause like Chelsea found some, she picked up some, they were like $300. Like, she's like, how did you find these boots that fit you? You're only like 60 bucks. I was like, I was meant to have these red boots. But as soon as I put them on, I, you just can't help but like, it gives you life or something. I don't know. So that's how I got the little red boots. And so they just be kind of, people would see me out in the red boots and they just kind of started associating it associating the red boots with me and red boot goof. I, I've always, I've loved Reno 911 and that whole new boot goof and thing. Like, hysterical. So, <laughs> you know, one night I was doing my red boot goof and stuff. And so that's how it just kind of came Did about. you even jump up in the air and do like the, the clicks there? I tried. I have a video somewhere of me trying. It doesn't look pretty. <laughs> That was such a great show. Like, but like as you like said, said that story there, I envisioned everything. Like, I envisioned you like walking into this place and like a light coming down on these boots. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's almost like a movie. And Country yeah. Cinderella would be a great <laughs> name for an album. That's a great name for an album or a song or some. You or somebody needs to do something. With okay, it. That's good. I'll write that down. No. I I don't know why I've never thought of that, but that's kind of like what it was. They, you know, they fit perfect. Yeah, well, I mean, like you said, it's kind of became um, your staple. Everybody knows. It did, and like, it was just good. because people would be like, and like, I, you know, I book music for Country Boy, and so I would go into Country Boy, and they're like, "Where's your red boots?" And I'm like, "I don't know. I don't wear them every day." 
Yeah, I was going to ask like if you perform with them every single show because I yeah I would I, to be honest I would kind of be disappointed if I, I went kind of I kind of it's a thing now and I played at Laurel Cove Music Festival this weekend but I was like it's going to be rainy and muddy and I was like I can't I'll fall <laughs> I'll break my leg again because I broke my leg this summer um, so I took like my good old farm boots <laughs> my big chunky boots. And then I would I changed when I performed, and put them on. Okay, okay. I, I I seen where you broke your leg. I'm sorry that happened, but h- how did that happen? <laughs> um. Well, we my son was riding his bike. He's seven, and he had a bad bike wreck. And he was like, "I'm never riding this bike again." And I was like, "Well, I'll ride it." And so I got on it, and um, my foot got off the side of the sidewalk, and I fell one way, and it went the other. Oh. Where where did you break your leg at? I broke the fibula and tibia, like both down, kind of near my ankle. Oh wow! My awesome. foot was backwards. Right, like, legit backwards. Mm-hmm. I'll send you a picture. I do kind of want to see it. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to say no, but then I'm like, wait, wait, I do want to see it. It's one of those things. I'm like, do you want to see it? It was backwards, and people were like, no, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're like, ugh. For real, like, so what, like, was, did it hurt right away, or, like, were you kind of in shock? I was in shock. I actually tried to turn it around. Mmm, mmm, ow, ooh, mmm, ooh, that put cold chills down me. I did. I was like, no, this ain't happening, because <laughs> I've never, I never broke a bone in my body. I was like, this is not happening. This is not. Oh, so, um, did it work? No. <laughs> Are you trying to, okay. No. Um, and so then I'm like crawling, vomiting. And so people were like, um, call 911. And, uh, but I actually like my neighbor, thank goodness. Oh, she's a nurse. Um, because I started like, I stopped breathing for a little bit and she had to do like sternal rubs on me, oh, all that kind wow. of fun stuff. So went what to the you room. to stop breathing? Huh? What caused you to stop? I think I went in shock. Just shock. Okay. Wow. That's heavy. I was like, <laughs> so I didn't walk. So not only was I, you know, like in quarantine, but I didn't walk from like July 23rd to like Thanksgiving. Did you have to learn how to walk all over again? I did. Yeah. yeah. I, I broke my leg. I broke the uh, femur bone. And okay. My, and oh, wow. uh, yeah, I went through the same exact thing. It's, I give babies a lot of credit. Like learning how to walk all over again, even just on one leg, it is very yeah. difficult. Yeah. My like physical therapy, I was like, do you hate me? Like, is this what hatred feels like? <laughs> because I feel like you hate me right now because it was hurt. But we're past that now. Thank goodness. I do got to be honest. Like some of the uh, pictures that you would post with you in the wheelchair You'd have some really funny captions. You you, 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 you took it like a champ. You had, you had fun with it. My Professor X Halloween costume. Yeah, I was going to break that up. Yeah, that was the best Halloween costume. I'll never I'll top ever. that. I'll never top that. I don't that. think you can. I'll, but I don't think that anybody can. Like, that was my <laughs> favorite costume of 2020. You killed it. My, I mean, I would switch. My dad was like, because we went to my parents neighborhood (laughs) it was just like but people there was like people would look at me and jared my brother jeremy was like i think they're just think you're an old man (laughs) like i don't know if people just know that you're actually professor x i was like i don't really care i I caught it whenever i seen and i was thought i just thought that is genius (laughs) <laughs> well, when I figured out that I was going to be a wheelchair at Halloween, I was like, well, because my family has always done Halloween, right? Yeah. My parents used to have awesome Halloween parties. Um, and I was like, when as soon as I figured out I was going to be in a wheelchair at Halloween, I was like, oh, I'm going to be Professor Ed. That's so cool. Uh, and I'm glad that you're like able to uh, walk again now. It's- yes, <laughs> yes. Okay. I love it. And drive. Oh yeah, I, I guess I didn't think about that. So, you, like, you did you break your right foot? Yeah. Mm. Wow. What was your kid around there at the time? He was, but my friend like took him away. Okay. Um, 
and kind of whisked him away like before the ambulance and everything got got away but um yeah, yeah. he i didn't think you know he I didn't think it bothered him. And then he was in school and they were talking about things he was scared of. And he was like, I hope my mom doesn't break her leg again. I was like, Oh gosh, you know, because so at that time, so I would, I had been working from home. Reed was doing virtual school and I had a broke leg. <laughs> so it was like, it's been a while, but I'm here. Yeah. I know 2020 has been a pretty crappy year for folks, but uh, that was sounded really crappy for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we made it. I love all the stuff that you're doing with your son, Reed, too. Like uh, earlier this morning, I seen the uh, video of him playing on the piano. Playing the keyboard? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's so cool. It was, uh, did you kind of have to talk him into being interested in music, or was that kind of just a natural thing? You know, he's always, like, um, he's always liked liked music. Um, I, we've got him, he's got drums, you know. Um, we have a cone up here that he, he likes playing. Um, when I was started, when I was doing the virtual ukulele club, you know, I was, I told him, I was like, you know, I've always like, when, do you want me to teach you how to play the ukulele? And so just like two weeks ago, he was like, mom, I think I'm ready to learn the ukulele. So he's got the C, he's got the C chord down. But, um, I, this morning he was like, I'm bored. I'm bored. I'm like, okay, we're putting together a schedule. And so, you know, so that you can get not be bored and not because I've got to work, you know. Um, so it's like, okay, it's art time. I was like, do you want to get out the paints? Do you want to get out, um, you know, paints? Do you want to draw or do you want to play the keyboard or something? It's like, I'll go play the keyboard. Um, Monday during my staff meeting, like, of course, I'm on mute because I'm just listening. He is just over like in the background, just play, <laughs> playing background music while I'm at staff. And I'm just like, okay, turn it down a little bit. But yeah, I, I thought one of the funny things that he done the other day, I seen you post about it, about the uh, bacon. What was it? About bacon when he goes into the other room and is on the microphone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what did, yeah, so I had my microphone cut up. Hit, um, what did he say? And the God said, let Reed have bacon or something like <laughs> that, like on the microphone. So it's like the whole house and maybe the neighborhood. That the gods have spoken. Reed needs idea. bacon. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, that that kid has a great sense of humor. Oh he is God. going places. Oh, he is so hilarious and so smart. So I'll tell you a funny story. This has nothing to do with what you're talking about, but it's cracked me up. So my uncle gave him this Jeff Gordon race car, a uh, Hot Wheel. It's like from 1996, and it has like a little car. So Reed. Um, and Reed's a an little entrepreneur. Like I grew up a little entrepreneur and Reed has done that too. Like he saw these golf clubs he wanted last couple of weeks ago and they were $10. He, it was like our neighborhood yard sale. Well, he comes up gets hot wheels, takes them downstairs. He made $55 Dang. because people were just giving him money. So he's a little entrepreneur. So he's like looking at this thing and he's like, how much do you think this is worth? I was like, Reed, I really don't know. You know, I was like, it's worth a lot because your uncle gave it to you. Like that's, you know. So he goes and gets the iPad and he's like, hey, Siri, how much is Jeff Gordon's race car worth? Of course, it comes up to like $10 million. Yeah. Reed's like, mom, we're rich. <laughs> he's like, we're rich. We're rich. And I was like, but he, it was for the car, not the Hot Wheel. Yeah. So, so then I'm like, Reed, I don't think that's it. And he's like, I'm, I'm FaceTiming Diddy. So he calls my dad. And he's like, Dad, he's like, Diddy, we're going to be rich. Like, I just found out Jeff Corden's car is worth 10, this is worth $10 million. And Dad's like, well, I don't know if it's worth that. And Reed's like, well, I'll sell it to you for 400 <laughs> Hey, yeah. Smart kid. So then he looks up the car on eBay. We look at it, it's like $4. And he's like, so then we try to tell him, you know, stuff like that. Maybe, you know, it, hang on to it. But the value is in that your uncle gave it to you, you know. Yeah. But boy, there for a second he was just like, "I love that." I also do four hundred bucks. <laughs> that kid, if he becomes a car salesman, he's going to be the best in Eastern Kentucky, no <laughs> doubt about it. Oh gosh, yeah. He can sell it ice to an Eskimo. He's a mess. How'd you go with really the name Reed too? I thought that's such a cool name. So my husband is a horticulture agent, and um, 
in Bourbon County. So he works with extension too. And then, so we kind of came to it as like read, like, um, in a flute, you know, like in a flute and music and then read like on a plant. Oh, okay. So it was kind of combining those two things. I love those unique names and they, and they seem to be popping up a lot more here lately. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with the names Kyle and John and Bill, but we just use the names a lot. I, I like how people are kind of coming up with these sometimes too weird of, names like how kanye named his kid northwest oh that yeah was going to be bullied so much in school i know well my mom wanted to name me so my maiden name was boykin and mom wanted to name me bonnie blue but boykin like from the bonnie blue the daughter from um gone with the wind yeah. and thank goodness my dad <laughs> put I a can, on that one i can dig it donnie blue boykin. no bonnie bonnie oh. blue boykin Bonnie Blue Boykin. Still not mad at it. I dig it. I dig it. <laughs> I'll tell mom. I mean, like, Eli approves. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, <clears throat> it, it's a, that would be a hard part. That, to me, I'm sure there's many, many difficult parts about having a kid. But that would be, because, I mean, like, whatever you name a kid, it really, like, predates their entire future. Like, if you yeah. name a kid Carl, He's probably going to be like a, maybe like a janitor or a, uh, you, you know what I mean? I, I, I give, okay, if some kid is named like Michael William the Third or something like that, he's going to be rolling a country one day, that right. kid, even if right. he's born in poverty. I mean, like, it's just like whatever you name a kid has so much to do with how their uh, future goes, I, I feel know. Maybe that's why Reed likes the outdoors and music. Maybe so. Well, of course I wanted to bring this up today. Yeah, yeah this, I'm telling you, the, uh, I forget this the, woman's name that, uh, I already forgot the woman's name that done these designs, but a big shout out to her and everybody that is. It's beautiful. It. It's so awesome. I didn't know they had a back and a big, if anybody wants to see the back, this is what the back looks like. Oh but, my gosh, I love that so much. It, it's so cool. It is so cool. So you're going to be doing a songwriting class at this? Yeah, yeah. So I'm doing ballad writing. Um, so when I found out that I was going to be like doing more arts things, I decided to take some classes at UK. And so um, one of the classes I took um, was Appalachian music. It was um, Appalachian music and history. And um Dr. Ron Penn taught it. And, you know, I had not written a song in a long, long time. And uh, I mean, probably because I had probably, I don't know, maybe seven years. I just kind of quit. I just kind of quit writing. Mm -hmm. um, and we had to write a ballad. And I, we learned about Appalachian ballads and the history of ballads and how, you know, it was kind of like your newspaper. That's how stories were passed. And before we had TV and newspapers and stuff. And um, we had a project to write one. And of course, my husband is from Paintsville. And we had to find a news story and turn that into a ballad. And so Ray's from Paintsville. And um, I found this picture of this rag doll. They had had floods. Um, so I'm trying to think of when that was. Uh, 2016, maybe? I don't know. It was, but there was a big flood that went through Paintsville. But there was this picture of this little rag doll um, that had washed up. And so the picture really struck me. And so I wrote the song uh, from the perspective of the rag doll losing her family in the flood. And so I love that ballad writing has kind of a structure to it. Cause you know, I don't write song a, a specific way, but in ballads there is, you know, there's a certain rhyme scheme, a certain amount of symbols. And so it's easy to teach people how to write a song because you know, it really breaks it down. Um, to being really specific and um, structured. So I have been kind of teaching that to uh, through 4-H um, around, the, around the state and to kids and adults. And um, it's, it's really fun. So it's neat to show kind of this, this history of Kentucky music um, and just music in general, and then allow people to, you know, to learn how to write a song in a fairly easy way. Like I've done it with um, kindergartners, I went to Teresa Prince's classroom um, in Lawrence County and we did it and we had so much fun. We did like K through fifth graders, but like with the little kids, um, I put like Mary had a little lamb. I break down the syllables and the rhyme scheme 
and they fill they we fill it out as a class. Um, so it's really really fun. It's uh, we Teresa and I had so much fun doing that together. Um, but it's just like I said, it's it breaks down ballad writing and it breaks down songwriting to a fairly easy structure that anybody anybody can do. So I'm excited to be bringing that uh, to the Mountain Girl experience. It's going to be an awesome event. And that's cool that you're teaching like kind of the little hidden details in a song. Cause yeah. sometimes like I'll do that with my friends or my wife or something like that. I like, if I hear something in a song that's cool, I'm like, Oh, I see what they done here. And like, I'll explain it to them. And they're like, you think about that way too much. Yeah. Like, oh, that's this, this probably what they were thinking. Or also like maybe people interpret it different ways or whatever. Right. But uh, yeah, I mean, people don't realize like the, all the behind the scenes that goes into creating a hit song. I love yeah. watching up behind the music documentaries. Right. Well, and I tell, you know, when I teach songwriting, you know, um, I teach it a little bit different than the ballad writing uh, that I teach. But, you know, um, the ballad writing, it just, it, like I said, there's no structure to songwriting. You know, like there are sometimes I'm driving down the road and, you know, something hits me um, and then I come up with a melody in my head and then I go back to the guitar and or sometimes I'm sitting and I'm plucking around the guitar and you know I'm words just come out so it's all it's all different for everybody but I love that ballad writing not only does it connect us to the roots of art and music in Kentucky but it also like I said it kind of simplifies the process for in, that anybody can do it and, and that's so cool that you're teaching to kids like in kindergarten I didn't know that you were going that young and that is so cool. I mean, yeah. most time people think something that like that should only be for high school students, but I don't think that at all. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, find that some of the younger kids catch on a lot quicker than you thought they would? You know, so when we went to, I have these like uh, story dice. And so what I would, we had like kids in groups of like three or four. And so I would have, they would roll the dice. And so like, like the tape and what they got their dice landed on is what they would write their, their ballad about. So, um, like they would get like rainbow and so the kids would work together. Um, so yeah, it, it, I have to change it up based on what age group, you know, I have like a worksheet, um, that's really specific for high, middle and high schoolers. Um, uh, but I usually do like the Mary had a little lamb with the, the younger kids. And at this, uh, at the uh, mountain girl experience, are you going to be teaching in all ages like you do? Yeah. So I'll probably start with the Mary had a little lamb, um, way of doing it. And we may do that as kind of like a group just to kind of get them going and then we'll go into the more in depth. But I want to, you know, I want to play um, some Gene Ritchie for them and, you know, introduce them to some, some different ballads and stuff. So, and then we'll get into the learning of how to put one together. So like, it's going to be like all ages, like you'll even work with adults and the yeah, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. I think this is going to be such a cool event right here. Cause I mean, if people go onto the website, I mean, you have food vendors on there, you got all the people performing, you got all the people doing little workshops like you are, like you were doing. It is such a neat little experience. And I'm so thankful that there's people like you and Chris and Beck and Sonora and all these wonderful mountain women who are getting the time that y'all deserve to shine and having such a cool event like this. I know. I'm, I guess I'm like an adopted mountain woman. I guess I'm married into the mountain woman. <laughs> Are you not like originally from the mountains? Georgetown. It's still, you know, there's, there's still some pretty good hills there. There are some hills in Scott County, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I would, yeah, I'm pretty country. So. <laughs> yeah, well, see, I, I'm the same way. I'm actually from middle Georgia. So like I'm from okay. like the flattest of flat. Right, right, right. But yeah, I'm a, I'm a hillbilly now. <laughs> and I love it. But Jen, I know you're a busy woman, so I'm going to let you get back to Alrighty. your life. And thank you for the talk today. And I can't wait to see you at the Mountain Girl Experience. Yay! Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Jen.